Business back in the glazing industry uh, that underpins our very way of life. In many ways, the Australian story is a mining story, and it is an important part of my own story. I grew up in a family with a deep appreciation for mining, and my grandfather, Sir George Fisher, spent 70 years in mining and was the founder and the first president of the Australian Mining Industry Council, now known as the MCA. Growing up in regional northwest Queensland and exposed to his passion for the good the mining sector can do in establishing strong regional communities like Mount Isa, I saw firsthand the benefits that a modern resource industry can bring, uh, including well paid jobs, community infrastructure, regional interconnectivity with upgraded power, road, rail, and air. But not everyone has had that first hand experience and knowledge. And as was identified in the Resources 2030 Task Force in 2018, Australia will only be able to extend its global resources leadership if it improves public attitudes towards the sector. This remains the number one priority for the resources industry because without community buy-in and support, the sector will continue to face increasing challenges. And whether that be from overzealous regulators who want to strangle the industry, an unworkable red and green tape, or from governments that greedily eye the short-term sugar hit of a tax grab on a successful industry without strong community support, the industry will face many risks. The good news is there is a positive story to tell. Resource extraction and mining remain an integral part of human existence and prosperity and will do so long into the future. All of us here today know that. But it is apparent that not only that many people not only ignore this pillar of our lives and our economy, but actively scorn it. It is unfortunately becoming an increasingly common reality that the next generation of Australians are full of misconceptions about the resources sector. Australian mines operate under some of the most stringent environmental regulations in the world and set high, high standards in mine site rehabilitation. In August this year, Chua Coal Mine, just five kilometres from Ipswich, became the first open cut coal mine in Queensland to be deemed fully rehabilitated. It can now be used for agriculture and is a great example of industry led action to not only meet strict environmental provisions but exceed them. And in Queensland, about a quarter of a mine, a quarter of the mines already use renewable energy. Two thirds of the state's resources companies plan to invest in lowering their emissions in the next 12 months, and 40% of them are already actively investing in low emissions technology. Australia's mining sector has a powerful story to tell on our environmental record. Our stewardship standards reach through innovation and research and development, technology advances, and importantly, collaboration between companies, with government, and with the community. And it is only by all of us in this room working together that we can convince those who become disconnected from the importance of the resources industry that mining is not just necessary, but rather that we are a positive, innovative, advanced industry that is a net good for society. Now, I said earlier that the Australian story is a mining story. In Queensland, Tasmania and South Australia feature a nod to mining on their coat of arms. Australia may have ridden on the sheep's back, but it was with the pursuit of minerals that accelerated our development as a modern nation. And that is one of the reasons why the Coalition has always been a strong supporter of the resources industry, and why we have time and again backed the sector. We backed the sector to the tune of nearly three and a half billion dollars to help with every aspect of your business, from surveying and exploration to new mine finance, research and development, training, rehabilitation and establishing and expanding more gas supplies. These are just a few of the recent initiatives of the coalition in a government that invest, we invested in because we believe in the future potential of the resources industry. We have a world-class sector here in Australia that goes from strength to strength. Growing global demand for mineral and energy commodities will continue uh, to increase and in many cases accelerate. By 2030, both metallurgical coal, coal and seaborne thermal coal it is expected to grow by around 24%. Aluminium by more than 45%, 
nickel by 67% and lithium by 368%. By 2040, global LNG demand will have doubled. And by 2050, global copper demand will have doubled. The question will be whether Australia supplies these commodities to the world or whether someone else does. This is both an opportunity and a risk. And the opportunity lies in providing a stable and attractive investment environment so that the 113 prospective mining projects that are currently at the feasibility stage have a reason to invest. That is a $52 billion of potential investment and tens of thousands of jobs in the pipeline. And unfortunately, many of the benefits of these resource projects get lost in the debate over energy generation. And as was recently put, we're obsessed with picking a winner, but we really need to be entering more runners in the race. And that is why instead of picking winners and losers by creating tax regimes to punish certain industries, the coalition instead supports technology-driven and technology-neutral solutions to achieving Australia's net zero emissions commitments while ensuring we continue to provide affordable and reliable energy. The coalition recently announced it would examine the potential for new and emerging nuclear technologies to contribute to Australia's energy security and to reduce power prices. And it is high time that Australia had an honest and informed debate on the benefits and costs of nuclear energy, particularly when the International Energy Agency's global pathway to reach net zero emissions by 2050 shows nuclear power doubling between 2020 and 2050. In the same vein, the IEA has also made clear that there is no realistic scenario to achieving net zero without carbon capture, utilisation and storage. That is why the Coalition invested more than $300 million over 10 years in carbon capture and storage projects and hubs, a proven and versatile technology that can cut emissions from energy intensive industries and help create a hydrogen export industry. And when it comes to the, to the increasing quantity of renewable technologies being deployed, such as solar panels, wind turbines and batteries, many critical minerals will play a fundamental role in enabling that production. That includes minerals and metals that are not yet on the critical minerals list, but are vital to the function of our modern, our future modern economy. For example, wind turbines require double the amount of copper compared to traditional power generators per megawatt. Nickel is a vital ingredient of electric, electric vehicle batteries not to mention stainless steel. Aluminium is a crucial component to solar panel modular frames, and antimony is a commonplace in renewable energy as a glass clarifier or a metal strengthener. This does not even begin to cover the myriad other essential uses for these and other vital minerals and rare earths uh, in our modern economy, including, for example, potash and phosphate, key ingredients in fertilizers which contribute to Australia's agricultural production and regional food security. There are so many opportunities I could talk about, but time is limited, and I must address the more sombre and sobering issues of risk. When I think about the risks the resources sector faces, it is clear that most of them fall under a broader category of complacency or taking the industry for granted. The assumption that it's always been there to support us and will always be there no matter the burdens that are heaped upon them. In a world where capital can be fluid and investment decisions are global, a stable and attractive regulatory environment is vital to keeping a future pipeline of development. And that is why it is concerning to see legislation done as part of a Greens deal that hamstrings government investment in important resources projects, investments which would have sent a signal that we back our resources sector whether through Export Finance Australia, the Northern Australia Infrastructure Facility, or Infrastructure Australia. And even more concerning is the claim by Greens leader Adam, ba Adam Vant that as a part of the deal, the list will expand to include additional, yet to be named, agencies across government. With newly legislated emissions targets, the risk of environmental activists and bad faith actors purposefully tying up projects in the courts on vexatious grounds until they fall over will increase, as we've seen in other jurisdictions around the world. 
And if the Greens will get to get their way, adding a climate trigger, the EPBC Act during its review has the potential to grind all resources development to a halt. Now, the time when the pain of skill shortages has been felt across all industries, policies designed to hamper labour hire in the resources sector will undermine the ability to tap into a surge workforce when it is needed most. With worsening economic forecasts, the risk of tax grabs to plug holes in budgets is ever present. In Queensland, the state government has made a sudden tax grab by introducing a top royalty rate for coal of 40% making it the highest taxing mining jurisdiction in the world. And all of this without real consultation. And as Japanese ambassador Shingo Yamagami pointed out, this will have widespread effects on Japanese investment beyond the coal industry. Not only with minerals, but hydrogen infrastructure and a variety of cutting edge technology. And in one fell swoop, the Queensland government has put doubt in the minds of investors including some of our closest international allies. And at the end of the day, when they have raided the piggy bank and there is no new investment, 40% royalty made on nothing will still be nothing. Now, your federal coalition government will never make large decisions that impact the, the industry without proper consultation. I cannot speak for the current government, but we recognise the diesel fuel rebate is not a subsidy any attempt to line the coffers by removing it would be an unjust tax on a key business input and a devastating blow to industry confidence. You have a great story to tell. Your work matters to every single person in Australia. You are not a bad industry. And I'll continue to be a strong public supporter. I look forward to being a voice of common sense in the mining and resources sphere. Because mining is a part of the national fabric and it is crucial to Australia's future. The Coalition understands this and will continue to promote it. We know that without mining, regional Australia suffers and all of Australia becomes weaker. We know that without mining, people in the big cities don't have first class, first world lifestyles. We know that mining makes us prosperous and prosperity gives us the ability to be first class environmental managers. And I commend Minister King for her support of new gas projects and I sincerely hope she is not the lone voice of sense and is able to convince others at the Cabinet table the need for more money, speedy approvals. The Government plays a key role in sending positive signals to business, society, schools and the media the mining's importance in all of our lives. The Coalition will always back the resources sector, the jobs you create, the wealth you generate, the building blocks for a modern society that you provide and the communities that you strengthen. Thank you.